Hi folks, John Cordisco from Cordisco's Chess Center in Upstate New York with another video. Uh, you can catch me on ICC or Play Chess. My handle name is Councilman John with another great video for you today. This is a video of the 1930s. I'm sure many of you have seen it before. I've got to go over it again in case some people haven't. And those that have seen it, I think we'll get a lot out of it the second, third, or fourth time. This is a game between Grandmaster Glicksburg and Grandmaster Miguel Nadorf. It's the Polish Immortal game. One of the what I call the evergreen games. These games will always be great. It's like a great movie. No matter how many times you've seen it or how old it is, good is still good and great is still great. So I'd like to go through it with you. Uh, Nadorf was black, so I'm going to flip the board here and take the black side. Uh, also, if you noticed, on the very bottom, I had my computer on. And as we get more into the game, uh, if you really want to try to guess the moves, if you've never seen this before, seen this game before, try to hold your something to block the moves, and I'll give you a, a, a hint when we get to it. But anyway, let's get started. Let's start out with d4. And Nadarf played the f5, which is the Dutch. c4, taking control of the center here, the center squares. Knight to f6, of course. Knight to c3. In the Dutch a lot, the key square to try to control for black is this square here, e4. For white, is this their square here, e5. So we continue on with e6. Looks like it might be a stone wall in the Dutch. f3. d5 for black. And e3 to shore up that pawn for white. c6 for black to shore up his d pawn. Bishop to d3 for white. And bishop to d6 for black. It's pretty typical uh, Dutch. Doesn't seem to be too anything extraordinary here. White castles, black castles. But what's going to happen surely here, folks, is just truly amazing. White goes knight to e2. Now, that's not a normal move here. I think what he was thinking was bring his knight over to the king side. Uh, you have the bishop bearing down, you have the white, the dark squared bishop bearing down for white. When this pawn moves, the queen's going to come in. I think he's pretty, he had a pretty good attack going, at least he thought. Adorf just develops. And he goes knight to g5. Which is a little surprising for a grandmaster because we all know what's going to happen. This bishop's going to take the h2 pawn. King's going to take knight checks and then queen takes off the knight. And that's exactly what happened. But in this case, White decided not to take the bishop, which ended up being, a, I think, a tremendous mistake. Now, you look at the bottom, it doesn't say much difference between king takes h2 and king to h1. White chose king to h1. Might not be a question mark, but it certainly is questionable. Uh, I probably would have taken the bishop and tried to tough it out. Anyway, what Nadorf did was knight to g4. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Now, we look at the computer here. Black's not really that far ahead. Not really. If he brings that knight around back to h3, according to the computer, I mean, he's, he's going to have to tough it out and suffer for a long time. But I think white might survive it. What white did was f4. Now... I think his thinking was, he has this knight here on an outpost. He's going to make him move the h-pawn to get move the knight. And he wanted him there in case another piece attacked. It was probably the only I can think of. And also, too, is trying to cut off the escape from the dark squared bishop for black here. Queen to e8. Now, look at this. What's coming now is this queen is going to be on h5 any second. And the attack is really going to start coming. It looks really bad for white right now. G3. I think he's trying to hide on the bishop. I think he's thinking if he has to give up a piece for two pawns and he can survive and he can win this game, it's probably was his thinking. Immediately, queen h5. 
here it comes. He can't survive the discovered check, so the king has to go to g2. Now, if you look at this, in a weird way, the dark squared bishop for black was kind of guarding white, kind of like a traitor in a way, shielding him from some, some attack from the queen and other things. And now, the dark squared bishop, even though he did a good job, as Gary Kasparov says when he sacrifices a piece, it deserved a better career. What do you do now? The bishop's in the way. Well, you just move it to g1. It sounds so simple when you say it, but to actually find it on the board would be amazing. Now, the king can't take, of course, because queen will check your mate. If the rook takes, queen checks, king moves over, queen mates. The knight has to take it. Because if we see right here, it's going to be made anyway. It's going to be curtains. Knight takes g1. And, of course, queen to h2 check. Now, so far, we've sacrificed one piece. And we're going to have to keep counting as we go on. You're going to see it's amazing. King to f3. Now, unless you've already looked at the bottom of the screen, for the rest of the game, it would probably be better if you could cover up at least the beginning there with uh, the suggested moves in the score. Because this is going to be amazing what's coming. So if you want to cover it up now, feel free before I make this move. And the next move is e5. Look at this pressure coming. And it's just coming. Takes, takes, the knight takes, this pawn, the rook's on this file. This knight comes up, this light square bishop's going to come. All of a sudden, just all heck breaks loose. D takes. And this knight takes, sacrificing himself and checking the king. F takes C5. Now that's two pieces sacrificed so far. Knight takes C5, checking again. The king goes to F4. Amazing. Amazing. This poor king. Knight to G6. Well, let's look at this for a moment. Where can the white king go? Nowhere. The only place he can go is F3. Now, here we are. These guys are sitting over the board in the 1930s. They didn't have the computers to help them analyze games or figure out openings. All this had to be done over the board. Over the board with the clock ticking and the pressure on. Nador finds the move. F4. Look at this. Look at this. King can't take. It's just amazing. I mean, what do you do if you're white? What do you do? Everything you do would be disaster. He takes with the e pawn. Now, we've sacrificed two pieces so far. What is the next move? Bishop to g4 check. Sacrificing a third piece. If the king moves, you lose the queen. King takes. Knight to e5, check. Sacri sacrificing a fourth piece. The king cannot move. It has to take the knight. And here we are. The final move. Four pieces sacrificed. You notice the queen, the bishop, and the rook over on white's queen side never even moved. Never even moved. And I love this more than anything. I love these kind of uh, checkmates. The lowly pawn. Probably the, the, the little foot soldier of the chessboard. Pawn to h5. Checkmate. The king can't move. The queen's guarding everything on this file. And the rook's guarding everything on this file. What an amazing game. Nador from the 1930s, great Argentine player. I believe Fisher, when he was young, played Nador. Uh, the Nador Sicilian was named after him. Amazing, brilliant player. And it was really a joy going through this game again. I loved it. The artistry, like a good movie. You can see it over and over and over. Excuse me, I'm a little hoarse today. I've got a cold. But that will finish up tonight's video. 
Remember, folks, if you think chess is just a game, you're not playing it right. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye, folks.